What's up, my people? This is Mr. Tui, creator of the SAT Crash Course Series. And if you're looking for an SAT reading walkthrough, you've come to the right place. In this video, I'm gonna walk you through a reading passage and help you develop two specific skill sets you need to succeed on the SAT reading section. The first skill set involves general reading comprehension with an emphasis on academic vocabulary. I'll help you develop that skill set in the first half of this video. In the second half of the video, I'm gonna teach you how to answer the questions using evidence in the text. You don't have to bring in your own opinion or any outside information. Focus solely on the question and the evidence in the text, and you'll find the right answer every time. So if you can learn and practice the skills I'm teaching you in this video, you can expect a 50 to 100 point increase on the SAT reading section. Oh, and by the way, if you like this video, you definitely want to access the full version of my SAT Crash Course series. Just click the link in the description below to access the full course. In the meantime, sit back, relax, and enjoy this SAT reading walkthrough. All right, welcome everybody to SAT Reading Crash Course. This is day one, part one. Uh, we're working on the reading section today. And we've got Caden with us. Say hi to everybody, Caden. Hi, guys. All right. Thanks, Caden. And um, today, yes, yeah, so we're doing reading. Um, I want to start with, um, with uh, the rules for reading, which we've got here up on the screen. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit also about the reading section. The reading section is a long-term sort of project. Okay, um, and when I when I say long term project, I mean, uh, you know, to get a boost on the reading section, there's there's really two elements going on here. You've got to do you've got to do two things. You've got to boost your reading comprehension first, just in general. Okay, so I'm going to teach you some skills that are going to apply to basically anything that you read on your own for all your classes, any of your own personal reading. I'm going to teach you sort of an approach to text and academic text specifically, the kind of text that they're going to test you on on the SAT. Okay, that's, that's the first part. And then the first uh, part of today's session, we're just going to talk about reading and approaching reading. Does that make sense, Caden? Yes. Okay, good. Then the second part is sort of answering the questions on the SAT reading section. Okay, and we're going to get to that in part two of today's session. But they're really kind of two different skill sets that we're going to be working on simultaneously. One approaching academic text and especially emphasizing academic vocabulary, and then approaching the questions the right way. So uh, both of those two we'll be doing kind of at the at the same time. Okay. All right, so let's start with uh, my rules for reading. Go ahead and read rule number one. You see it there on the screen, Caden? Yes. Okay, read rule number one for my rules for reading. Okay, look up every word you don't know from this point forward. Do it. Yes. All right, I cannot emphasize this enough, Caden, how important this is, um, and for anybody watching the recording as well. You need to make a habit of looking up any vocab word you don't know. You just need to do it. And that applies to any prep you're doing for the SAT, that applies to any reading you're doing for your classes, or any reading you're doing on your own. When you see a word you don't know, you need to look it up. Okay? And the okay. reason for that is, if you know the vocab, this is the biggest factor, by the way, for, for student success on the SAT reading section, is academic vocabulary. If you know the words you're reading, you understand the ideas being communicated. It's that simple. And if you don't know the words that you're reading, you don't understand the ideas being communicated. It might as well be a foreign language. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, and it's the same thing. If you study foreign language like French or Spanish or whatever, German for that matter, uh, if you understand the words that you're reading, you can understand the ideas. And if you don't understand the words, you don't know what you're reading. It's, it's that simple, and it's that simple for academic texts as well. So don't be intimidated by academic texts. It's mostly a vocab issue. And once you know what the words are, you understand the ideas. So you have to get in the habit of looking up every single word you don't know. It's a small investment of time up front, but it's going to slowly build over time. After like four weeks, five weeks of looking up every word you don't know, first of all, you're, you're not going to have to look up as many words because you're going to know what more words mean. But you're just going to start understanding everything you're reading in a relatively short period of time. I mean, I'm talking like, you know, certainly after like two months, three months of this habit, um, you're just, your reading comprehension is just going to explode. And um, it's a long-term project, but I, I, I can't recommend enough. It's, it's absolutely necessary if you're going to succeed on the reading section. There's no amount of like strategy or approach to the questions or little tricks I can teach you if you don't understand the ideas being communicated in the passage. Does that make sense, Caden? Yes. Okay, so that's rule number one. Go ahead and read rule number two for us, please. Okay, read for meaning. Don't just rush through text. Slow down, reread when necessary, and ask yourself, what ideas is the author trying to communicate here? Yeah, and so we're going to approach this text very, very, very carefully. Now, of course, you can't do this on the actual SAT. It's a time test. You know, they give you like 65 minutes to answer like 52 questions. You know, you're going to have to go through it quickly. But 
But um, but to start at least, we're going to be doing just untimed work. We're gonna we're gonna emphasize approaching academic text the right way. So take your time. There's just no rush here. We're gonna read well, but you have to read well slowly first before you can read well quickly. So we're gonna take all the time in the world. Again, this first part of today's session, we're gonna read one passage, and it's probably gonna take the whole time because we're reading a passage from the 1800s. A lot of high-level academic vocabulary, a lot of kind of complex, um, complex sentence structure, stuff like that. So we're gonna practice approaching academic texts the right way. Any questions, Caden? Uh, no. Okay, let's jump into it. So we've got a, a PSAT practice this year. I really like this, um, I really like this passage. This is a Jane Austen passage. Have you ever read Jane Austen before, Caden? Um, pos po wait, I think I, yeah, I just wrote about um, her okay. in the author profile. Okay, yeah, I, I wrote some essays on Jane Austen novels that I never read when I was in high school. Um, and uh, I never appreciated Jane Austen much as a student. I really like her now. Um, she really just gets character and uh, human nature. She just really gets it. I, I didn't appreciate a lot when I was younger. Um, this is this passage is over 200 years old. And right. um, so we're going to see some words here that either you've never seen before or just have very different meanings today. Um, it, it's a tough passage, but we're going to chew on this language. We're going to talk a lot about uh, vocab, and, uh, and we're going to understand it before we approach the questions, okay? So I would love to read this together. If you'll read loud and proud, starting with uh, the introduction. You've got to read the introductions to these passages. They provide some good context what we're about to read. Okay. Go ahead and start with the introduction to this passage and we'll read through it. I'll be stopping you a lot. I'm just warning you. We're talking right. a lot about vocabulary here. Go ahead. This passage is adapted from Jane Austen, Emma, originally published in 1815. Okay, yeah, over 200 years old. All right. Yeah. Um, go ahead and read that first paragraph, please. Okay. Emma Woodhouse, um, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence, and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. Okay, I'm going to stop you real quick. A couple things real quick. That word handsome, right? And the Woodhouse yes. is described as handsome. Uh, we probably wouldn't describe a young lady as being handsome today. It's a little yeah. bit surprising, I think, right? Somehow, and I don't know when the transition happened, <clears throat> but now that word is reserved for good-looking men. Uh, but back in those days, just be aware, you could call a young lady handsome and it would be a fine compliment back in those days. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Okay. Now that word disposition, she has a happy disposition. What do you think that word disposition means? Um, like overall feeling to her. It's not just feeling to her. Like It's more specific than that. Um, disposition here kind of means like personality. She is, she is disposed to be a certain way. She's inclined to be a certain way. And that's kind of her personality here. So she's just kind of like a happy personality or happy, like emotional state consistently. Gotcha. Does that make sense? She's disposed yes. to be happy. Okay. Now here, this is, this part's tricky. It says she seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence. Kid, what in the heck does that mean? Um, I would probably say that she seemed to be, she almost like, um, how am I trying to word this? What does unite mean? Uh, bring together. Bring together. So she seemed to unite, or bring together, some of the best blessings of existence. You can figure that out. Yeah, she was, um, she seemed to kind of bring, like, make things better, in a way. I think is what they're trying to say here. I don't here. see necessarily making things better, although I suspect that's probably the case, too. You know, she probably did bring up the people around her. I mean, if you have a happy disposition, you're handsome and clever and rich. But but here, it's, it's it's more specific, saying she 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 brought together, like, all the good things a person could have going on, she unites that in herself, right? She's good-looking, she's smart, she's rich, she's got a great personality, right? In today's terms, you might say she's got it going on. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So she's kind of, this kind of restates what they said. Yeah, Exactly. Exactly, right? She's kind of like, she's the, she's the total package. She's just like, she's just a, a, a great girl. She's, and she's got everything going, she's got everything going her way. Does that make sense? Yes. She seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence, like the best things that a person could have going for them. She's got it going on in one package. Does that make sense? Yes. That's it, 
Okay. Now the next part says she lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. What does vex mean? Do you know? Vex. Um... I tell you what, go ahead and look it up. And this is what I'm going to encourage anybody, you know, sort of doing this work on their own. If you see where you don't know, just type it in. Just, honestly, just do a Google search. Just type in vex and then definition. And the Google definitions are generally pretty straightforward. I kind of like them. When you see some, you might see some more complex definitions you're using, using like dictionary.com or like another dictionary of some sort. The Google ones are pretty straightforward. So go ahead and just type in vex definition and tell me what you see. Okay. Um, it says uh, to make someone feel annoyed, frustrated, yeah. or worried, Great. especially with trivial matters. Great. To, to annoy. You know, synonyms yeah. are good too. If you type in vex and synonym, go and type in vex and synonym. I'm curious what you get. I'm guessing you get something like annoy. Uh, annoy, irritate, infuriate. Right. Synonyms, are, synonyms are great too. In fact, maybe even better, right? Because then you just find a synonym that you can kind of plug in that sentence and make sense of. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So she lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex or annoy her. Does that idea make sense? Yes. Okay. So she's had a, she's had a comfortable life. Not not any real problems going on here. At least at this stage, you know, 21 years in the world. Any questions? Right. Uh, no. Okay. Okay. Now that we know what all the words mean, go ahead and read that paragraph again. I think it's going to make a lot of sense very easily. Go ahead, and, go ahead and take that again. Okay. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect sense, especially if you know the vocabulary. Right. Okay. All right. Let's read the next paragraph. Go ahead. Okay. She was the youngest of two daughters of a most affectionate, indulgent father, and had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, been mistress of his house from a very early period. All right. Whoa. A lot, lot going on there. Woo. Okay. Let's talk about vocab. Um, so she has an indulgent father, an affectionate, indulgent father. What does indulgent mean? Um, indulgence, I, I think here it would be like, he's very um, hands-on, caring, like, Wanting to be there to support his family. Yeah, maybe. Go. I want you to look up indulgent real quick. Just do indulgent definition. Okay. Tell me what you what you get. It's, it's, it's more specific than that. Um, having a tendency to be overly generous. Ooh, or, yeah. yeah, overly is... generous. Interesting, right? Which is a little yeah. bit different from what you were saying. It's, it's, it's more specific. If, if a parent is overly generous to their children, what usually happens to the child? They get spoiled. They get spoiled. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? If kids get used to, like, getting everything they want, they just assume they're always going to get what they want. You get a spoiled, yeah. you get a spoiled <laughs> brat. Okay? It's not good. It's not good. You can be generous. That's good to be generous. But overly generous? You can be overly generous. If you give people what they want all the time, they're going to start expecting it. We're just going to create flaws in, in character. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Normally when you hear that term indulgent, you see it, I see it a lot on chocolate commercials. And oh, like, yeah. Indulge yourself. Indulge your senses. Right. And, uh, and that's, that's what that means. Be overly generous with your senses. Anyway, so he's a little bit indulgent, a little bit overly generous. All right. And then Emma had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, as a result of her sister's marriage, been mistress of his house from a very early period. What does mistress mean here? Uh, like the lady of the house. The lady of the house. Perfect. Per very different, um, very different definition than sort of the modern common usage of mistress today. Let's recognize that, right? Right. That means you know, that just means something very different today. I'm not going to get into that right now. But it's it's the fee it's the feminine form of master. So if you're the master of the house, you're the man of the house. If you're the mistress of the house, you're the lady of the house, the highest ranking woman in the house. Does that make sense, Katie? Okay. Yes. Okay. So why would she be? Why is she the highest ranking woman in the house? It tells us why. Because of her sister's marriage. Her sister's marriage, right? Her sister got married, went off to live with her husband. Now she's the highest ranking woman in the house. Does that make sense? Yes. We'll find out where her mom is or was here in just a moment. Go ahead and read the next sentence, please. All right. Her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses and her place had been supplied by an excellent woman as governess who had fallen little short of a mother in affection. Okay. So much going on here. It's so easy to read that and be like, yeah. what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so much going on. Okay. But again, I'm guessing there's some vocab that you didn't fully understand. 
Okay, so let's talk about the vocab here. So her mother died too long ago to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses. What does indistinct mean? Okay. Indistinct, it's like, um, it's kind of like a blurry, hazy. Yeah, thing. yeah, unclear, unclear, yeah. right? Indi a distinct would mean clear. So indistinct means not clear. So even if you're like, not sure what indistinct means, you know, you know what distinct means? We'll figure out something yeah. the opposite of distinct. Okay, so it's unclear, blurry, hazy, I love it. So she has a blurry remembrance of her caresses. What is a caress? Like her her loving touch. Loving touch. A gentle touch. Absolutely. Right. And if you didn't know what that means, you know, look it up. At this point in your prep, you know, if you just started the reading section, you just need to use this as an opportunity to boost your vocab. But yes, it does mean a gentle touch. So her mother had died too long ago for to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses. So what does that mean? That she, she can barely remember it. She barely remembers her mother. All she remembers, she has an unclear memory of her touch. That's it. Does that make sense, Caden? Yes. Okay, let's keep reading. And her place had been supplied, and supplied here just means replaced. Her place had been replaced or supplied by an excellent woman as governess. What's a governess, Caden? Um, like, I'm not sure what it would mean here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, go ahead and look up governess. Governance definition. Google it. Um, a woman implied to teach children in a private household. Yeah, I think mean, it should say employed, right? Employed to teach children? Yes. Yeah, it's so, like governance is like a nanny. That's also like responsible gotcha. for education and discipline. Think um, like Mary Poppins. Right. You seen? Have you seen Mary Poppins? Yes. Or like uh, Sound of Music? Yeah, I don't know if that's any, okay. You, you're familiar with those. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of a lot of kids watch this. I'm not familiar with those movies. <laughs> that's, whatever, that's fine. But um, but yeah, it's 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 you're you're acting like a parent basically, right? For discipline and education in the household. That's it. Okay. Right. So um, so her mother had been replaced by an excellent woman as governess. Now it says who had fallen little short of a mother in affection. What does that mean, Caden? Um, that she was that she. Um, was not the same as like a mother figure in the house. She was not the same. She, she kind of, um, yeah, she, she wasn't, um, she didn't give the same care. She did not, mother. no, but notice that here it says, Caden says she had fallen little short of a mother. Oh, so not very, like, she was very much as, like, similar. Yeah, she's almost as affectionate as a mother. A lot of students read this and they get the opposite impression from the one that's trying to be communicated here, right? They read this and they're like, oh, she's not very affectionate. No, 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 no. It's the opposite. She had fallen little short of a mother in affection, right? If she'd fallen greatly short of a mother in affection, okay, she's not very affectionate. But she had fallen little short of a mother in affection. This governess loves Emma almost as much as a mother would love her. Does that idea make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. Be careful there, right? That one word, right? Little. Sure. It's a greatly short kid. Different deal. But she's fallen a little short of a mother. She's almost as affectionate as a mother. I want you to read that paragraph again now that we know this vocabulary. I think it's going to make a ton of sense. All right. She was the youngest of the two daughters of a most affectionate, indulgent father and had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, been mistress of his house from a very early period. Her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses and a and her place had been supplied by an excellent woman as governess who had fallen little short of a mother in affection. Does that make sense now? Yes. Perfect sense. Once you understand basically what the words what the words mean. You might have to reread a sentence or two. You're like, wait, what is that going on there, right? And kind of just chew on the language a little bit. Consider what the author's possibly trying to communicate here. But, um, you know, and that's okay. Especially at this stage in the game, we're doing untimed work. You know, if you don't understand what you're reading, go back and reread it. That's okay. That's good. Especially once you know what the vocab means. Go back and reread it. Right. Any questions? Uh, no. Okay. Let's read the next paragraph. Okay. Sixteen years had Miss Taylor been in Mr. Woodhouse's family, less as a governess than a friend. Very fond of both daughters, but particularly particularly um, of Emma. All right. Does, that make, does them, that make sense right there, that sentence? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, good. Keep Between them, it was more the... In a, Intimacy of sisters. What does intimacy mean, Caden? Um, a relationship. What kind of relationship? If you have an intimate relationship um, with someone, what does that mean? Like, um, 
I don't know how to word it. You can look it up. Look up intimacy. Intimacy definition. Okay. A closely acquainted, uh, familiar, close. Yeah. A, a close relationship. That's it. Right? If you're intimate with someone, you're close with someone. Right? Right. Okay. So between them, between Emma and, and, and uh, Miss Taylor, it's a very intimate, it's like the intimacy of sisters. Okay. They're very close. Keep reading from line 19, even before Miss Taylor. Even before Miss Taylor had ceased to hold the nominal office of governess, the mildness of her temper had hardly allowed her to impose any restraint. All right, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you. Woo! There's some vocab there. Okay. So even before Miss Taylor had ceased, do you know what it means to cease? To stop. To stop, yes. Cease and desist, yes. I'm sure, actually not sure what desist means, but that's okay. But cease means to stop, yes. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so even before Miss Taylor had stopped holding the nominal office of governess. Do you know what nominal means, Caden? Um, head? That's like a, the that's top a, of it? That's a good guess. Um, do you know any Latin, Caden? Um, it's been a long time. <laughs> Do you know any Latin. Spanish? Um, slightly. What does nombre mean? Uh, nombre. wait, like, like, you know what I mean? Like the number? No, no, no. Nombre is name. Name. Oh. Name. Right. In, it's uh, been a long time. in, in Latin, yeah, you're, you're good, you're good. Uh, uh, in, in Latin, uh, in nomine patrius et filius et the spiriti santi, right? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Nomine means name. Okay, it's where we get the word like to nominate someone to a position. It just means to name them to a position. Okay. okay. So even before Miss Taylor had stopped holding the nominal office of governess. Now here office doesn't mean like, you know, a room, right? It means the position, right? right? We talk about like the office of the presidency or something like that. We're talking about the position of the presidency, not the Oval Office, right? We're not talking about where he works. We're talking about the position. So even before she'd stopped holding the nominal office of governess. Okay. So this is even while she was still being called the governess. Keep reading. Right. The my well, the mildness of her temper. What does temper mean here? Um what's a synonym for temper? Like her her um I don't know. A lot of students read this and they think it means anger. Right? Because you're like we hear the phrase like, oh, I've got a bad temper. Real bad temper. Okay. Well, the reason why that's ang like implies anger is because it's a bad temper or a bad temperament. Temper is a synonym for, for temperament, which means personality. Right? Right. So she has a very mild temper or mild temperament or mild personality. She's kind and gentle. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So the mildness of her temper had hardly allowed her to impose any restraint. What does that mean to impose any restraint? What was impose mean? Um, What's impose mean? To like put put upon. Yes, put like, upon to force. Yes. To force any restraint. And to restrain means to hold back. Right. So what does it mean here? What's the author saying? When she says the mildness of her temper, the mildness of her personality, had hardly allowed her to impose any restraint. What does that mean? Uh, it means that she was like so gentle that she barely would um barely would like put any punishment on her. Yeah, yeah. She couldn't restrain, you know, Emma in any way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. So even before Miss Taylor had ceased to hold the nominal office of governess, so even while she was still being called the governess, the mildness of her temper hardly allowed her to impose any restraint. Keep reading, please. And the shadow of authority being now long passed away, they had been living together as friend and friend, very mutually attached, and Emma doing just what she liked, highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but directed chiefly by her own. Yeah, what does it mean when it says she's highly esteeming? Emma is highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment. What's that mean? Um, it would be that um, she has, like, a like an ego, maybe? Um, I, don't think, I don't see anything about ego here. What does it mean to esteem someone or something? If you hold someone in high esteem, what's that mean? Like, um, to think well of them? Yeah, to think well of them, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so, so Emma 
it highly esteems Miss Taylor's judgment. Thinks very highly of Miss Taylor's judgment. That's all. Does that make sense? Right. And then yes. it says, but she's directed chiefly by her own. What does that mean? That she goes by what um, she thinks is right. Yeah, yeah. So she respects Miss Taylor's judgment, but she does what she wants. She's directed chiefly right. by her own judgment. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. Whew. A lot going on in that paragraph. Okay. Not all the paragraphs, and certainly not all the passages, are this difficult have this much right. language to chew on. Okay, In fact, the rest of the passage is, is much more straightforward. These first three are really tricky. But I want you to read this paragraph again, now that we've talked about the vocab, now that we've chewed on the language a little bit. Read it. I think it's going to make perfect sense. Okay. Okay. Um, where was I reading from? From line 15. 16 years. Okay. 16 years had Miss Taylor been in Mr. Woodhouse's family, less as a governess than as, than a friend, very fond of both daughters, but particularly of Emma. Between them, it was more the intimacy of sisters. Even before Miss Taylor had ceased to hold the nominal office of governess, the mildness of her temper had ha hardly allowed her to impose any restraint, and the shadow of authority being now long passed away. They had been living together as friend and friend, very mutually attached, and Emma doing just what she liked, highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but directed chiefly by her own. Does that make sense, Caden? Yes. Okay, good. It's just a vocab game, man. It's just a vocab game. If you know that the vocabulary... That sentence is so long. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It just yeah. goes on and on. And, and sometimes you're going to have to... Stop. Even if you know the vocab, you got to stop and you got to reread. Okay? Yeah. And that's okay. That's because the more that you get familiar with this kind of language, this kind of high-level academic language, and this sort of very you know formal, um, more complex syntax, which is just a fancy word for sentence structure, the easier it gets. But you've got to be able to do it first, untimed, on your own, before you can do it timed on an actual SAT. So you just got to practice this. You got to practice reading well. Okay. I'm guessing you're familiar with sort of like with the, <laughs> you've experienced this before where you like read a page or two in like a text or in a novel or in a textbook and you stop and you're like, what did I just read? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like those days are over. Don't do that anymore. That's how you build up bad habits. And that's how you never improve your reading comprehension. If you approach text like, if you're like, oh, I've got this like 20 page assignment, I gotta read it. Great, okay, you write it. Great, you spent 20 minutes reading 20 pages. Congratulations, you learned almost nothing. <laughs> Every text is an opportunity for you to learn better, like learn higher level vocabulary, to, to understand more complex ideas. Every single thing you read is an opportunity to do that. You've gotta take advantage of that opportunity. Otherwise, you're just gonna struggle on all these passages. Gotcha. And there's no like amount of strategy or anything I could teach you when we're talking about approaching the questions that's going to help if you don't understand the ideas being communicated by the author. Does that right. make sense, Caden? Yes. Okay. So that's the name of the game right now. It's just <laughs> approaching text the right way. You got to take your time. I call it reading for meaning. And uh, and if you read something and you don't understand the meaning, you don't understand the ideas being communicated. You got to find a way to to find out what's being communicated. Most of it's vocab, it's 90% of the game. And then okay. rereading and kind of considering possibly the ideas, especially in the, in the context of the past where the ideas being communicated. Okay? Okay. All right, let's keep reading. So we're at the top of the second column here, the real evils. This is line uh, 28. Go and take it. Okay. The real evils indeed of Emma's situation were the power of having rather too much her own way and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. All right, we'll stop. R real quick, so the word evil's here, right? We're talking about like evil, like Satan or something like that here. I mean, just like a bad thing that's going on, a problem. Right. Okay, so the real problems of Emma's situation were the power of having rather too much her own way and dis disposition to think a little too well of herself. What does that mean? Um, the, so the power of having rather too much in her own way, it's saying that she... She's a little bit, she gets what she wants. And then yeah. a disposition to think a little too well of herself. She has a habit to, to have an ego. Yeah, yeah. She definitely got some ego here. Um, and this ties in, you know, to what we were talking about earlier about her having an indulgent father. She's used to getting what she wants. She gets what she wants, right? Her father gives her what she wants and and uh, Miss Taylor doesn't hold her back, right? She gets what she wants. Right. 
and she thinks a little too well of herself. I don't need any names, but do you know of any people that think like they don't have any problems or anything wrong with them? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. These, these people exist. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's a thing. And, and Emma's one of those people. Like she's just like Miss Perfect. She thinks a little bit too well, a little bit too well for herself. And there's no more wrong. She's got a lot of good things going on in her life. She does. Right. But everybody's got problems. Well, they, they recognize them not. Yeah. And it's a problem to think you don't have problems. That's a problem. For sure. Yeah. So that's what's going on. And we see that word disposition again, right? She is disposed. She's inclined to think a little too well of herself. Does that all make sense? Yes. Okay. Keep reading, please. These were the disadvantages which threatened alloy to her many enjoyments. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm stepping okay. So this is an interesting sentence here. So these were the disadvantages. Here they mean sort of like disadvantages like socially and personally for her, right? The, the bad things she had going on, the problems. And it says, which threatened alloy to her many enjoyments. Do you know what an alloy is? Um, not really. You may have heard it before in the context of in like a science class, especially when we're talking about like a combination of metals, which is what an alloy yeah. is generally referred to, right? Like bronze is a classic example of an alloy because it's a combination or mixture of bron of uh, sorry of copper and tin. Okay, bronze isn't an right. element; it's a combination of two elements, copper and tin. It's an alloy. Okay, does that make sense? You've gotcha. heard that. You've heard that before, yes. maybe. Okay. So here, and this is very funky because I'll be honest; I'm not sure even like what part of speech alloy is here. If it's like a verb or. Or I guess it's like that, but it's it's a very funky sentence structure here. But the idea is that it's threatened; these disadvantages threatened to combine. They threatened alloy to her many enjoyments. That is her many personal and social enjoyments. The good things she has going on in her life. Gotcha. Does that idea make sense? Yes. Okay, and you can kind of figure that even though the sentence structure is funky. And I'll be honest; I don't fully understand. Like I don't fully get the sentence structure or all the parts of speech here, but I I get the idea, and that's good enough here. Okay. Yeah. The danger, please. Okay. The danger, however, was at present so unperceived that they did not by any means rank as mi misfortunes with her. What does that mean? Um, that she didn't notice. Yeah. She didn't know. Yeah. She doesn't see these problems as problems, which we right. discussed earlier is a problem. Okay. Any questions about that paragraph or are we good? I think we're good. Okay, good. Let's keep reading, please. Line 35. Sorrow came. Okay. Sorrow came. A gentle sorrow, but not at all in the shape of any disagreeable consciousness. Miss Taylor married. Okay, it was stop, on stop, stop. What does uh, what does disagreeable mean? Um, well, to not agree. Yeah, it, it's, right, it's the opposite of, of agree. But what what is what would that mean? Disagree, uh, not in the shape of any disagreeable consciousness. Um, I think here it's like saying that she didn't. Oh, maybe she didn't, like, fully think about it. Yeah, she's not, yeah, exactly. She's not fully aware of it, right? Yeah. And, and, and like, and, and here disagreeable search to me is, like, uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. I love, uh, in, like, really old movies, like, the, people talk about, like, uh, that that soup did not dis did not agree with me. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard that. That's a really interesting phrasing, right? Yeah. But, like, it just means, it's, it's, it here disagreeable just means un uncomfortable. So she's not fully gotcha. aware of this, not fully aware of, it's, it's a gentle sorrow. She's not right. like, you know, in this tormented state or anything like that. She's not even fully aware of it. But this gentle sorrow came when Miss Taylor married. Okay. Uh, keep reading from line 37. It was Miss Taylor's loss. It was Miss Taylor's loss which first brought grief. It was on the wedding day of his beloved friend that Emma first sat in a mournful thought of any continuance. Yeah, and here we're talking about, like, the continuance of, like, of their relationship, of their friendship. Right. Okay, keep reading. The wedding over and the bride people gone, her father and herself were left to dine together with no prospect of a third to cheer a long evening. Her father composed himself to sleep after dinner, as usual, and she had then only to sit and think of what she had lost. Mm, okay. Um, so what's going on here at this point? Um, it's kind of like saying how the wedding, it, it's kind of going from that point of her through the, like the wedding and the uh -huh. aftermath of how yeah. she's feeling after that. Yeah. Yeah. And how, she, how is she feeling? Um, very sad. Not good. Yeah. 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 It says, um, there was no, there was no prospect of a third to cheer a long evening. What does that mean? 
um, there was nobody else to like make her feel happy. Yeah, yeah, right. It was just her and her father eating together, right? And it says her father composed himself to sleep after dinner. You know what composed means here? Composed himself um, to sleep? Like to make yourself? Yeah, I mean, I mean, just, just, just got ready. Got ready for bed. He composed himself to sleep right. after dinner. Yeah. And then, it, and then she, now she's alone. And she has only to sit and think about what she had lost. So she's lonely. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, that's not too bad. Let's keep reading. Okay. The event had every promise of happiness for her friend. Mr. Weston was a man of unexceptionable character, easy fortune, suitable age, and pleasant manners. Okay, let me stop you real quick. Uh, that word unexceptionable, do you know what unexceptionable means? Um, unbelievable. Not necessarily unbelievable. Uh, that would be like incredible or something like that. It's not unbelievable. It's, it's unexceptionable, which is the opposite of exceptionable. Okay. If it were exceptionable, then there would be exceptions to his character. You'd be able to take exception to his character. You're like, he's a decent guy, but uh, you know, like he drinks too much, or he gambles, or something like that. Right, Either so he just seems like character. a good dude all around. He's a good dude all around, exactly, exactly, right? Does that make sense? Be yes. Because it's not exceptional, it's unexceptionable. There are no exceptions to his character. He's a really good guy. All around. And that also makes sense in sort of the context, right? It's like a list of right. things he's got going for him. He's got an easy fortune. He's got money, right? And he probably doesn't work too hard. He probably owns land or something like that. Property. Yeah. Suitable age. You know, he's probably older than her, but he's not like 70. Present right. manner, right? He's got, which was a thing in those days, in some respect, even to these days. But, but um, but uh, yeah, so he's 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 a good guy. He's a good guy. Keep reading, please. Okay. Um, there was some satisfaction in considering with what self-denying, generous friendship she had always wished and promoted the match. Okay, what does that what does that mean? Um, there was some satisfaction in considering with what self-denying, generous friendship she had always wished and promoted. The um, she wished that she knew him better. I don't see that. There was some satisfaction in something. In what? In uh, having him around, maybe? Uh, I mean, I, I think that's where you're going off into your imagination a little bit, not focusing on the text quite enough. Okay. Let's break it down. Let's break it down. Okay. okay. So you may, I mean, you're making some reasonable guesses here, but, but they're, they're guesses and they're not based on on evidence of the text. So there's some satisfaction in considering, or thinking about, right, with what self-denying, generous friendship she had always wished and promoted the match, that is, promoted the match between Miss Taylor and Mr. Weston. Okay. Okay? Okay. So here's kind of, here's how I like to explain this part here. Um, so she, she, she kind of encouraged, she encouraged Miss Taylor to marry Mr. Weston. Is that clear? She had wished and promoted the yes. match. Yes. Right? She encouraged them to get married. And it says here, there was some satisfaction in thinking about with what self-denying, generous friendship. Like, she's thinking the whole time, like, I am such a good friend. Like, I think she, part of her recognized it may not have been in her best interest. Maybe not. She never fully thought about the consequences of it. But she knew, like, when she was encouraging her friend, Miss Taylor, to get married, that their relationship was probably going to be different. I think she had to recognize that on some level. Right. right? And the whole time, she's like, I'm such a good friend. Like, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about my friend, right? <laughs> but even in her act of like focusing on her, like doing this good thing for a friend, she's like taking self-satisfaction in that. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like even that, even her act of selflessness is somewhat selfish. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like there's yeah. a, I don't know, you ever watch Seinfeld? Are you familiar with Seinfeld? Uh, I've not watched it. There's, there's, it's an old, boy, <laughs> I've got references to Seinfeld and like sign-up music and all this. I am old. Uh, kind of. Anyway. That's another conversation another time. But um, uh, there's a Seinfeld episode where Jerry, who's the main character, is like going around like doing good things all day long. Like he's helping like old ladies cross the street and he's holding doors open for somebody. He's got a bunch of bundles in her hand. Like he's doing all these things. And the whole time in his head, he's got like a narrative going on in his head. He's like, I am such a good person. <laughs> he's thinking of that the whole time. And what's funny, but like he's so focused on himself, like being satisfied with being a good person. Like he doesn't see that the things he's doing are actually causing more problems. Like he helps the old lady cross the street, but like an accident happens. 
as a result, or like the lady with the bundles like ends up tripping. Like, and he's not paying attention to that. He's just so satisfied with himself. Does that make sense? Yes. And there's a little bit of that going on here. Yeah. A little bit, right? There was some satisfaction considering with which, what self-denying, generous friendship she'd always wished him to want to Okay. Anyway, that's the idea. It's not terribly important, but I just want you to understand. Keep reading from line 53, but it was a black morning's work. But it was a black morning's work for her. The want of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour of every day. What does that mean, the want of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour of every day? Um, she would miss her. Yeah, she missed Miss Taylor every hour of every day. Absolutely. Keep going. She recalled her past kindness, the kindness, the affection of 16 years, how she had taught and how she had played with her from five years old, how she had devoted all her powers to attach and amuse her in health, and how nursed her through the various illnesses of childhood. A large debt of gratitude was owing here. All right, I'm going to stop you real quick. What is going on here in this this part of the passage? Um, she's just kind of thinking back on everything. Yeah, yeah, like on her childhood, right? Right. And what's she thinking about, like specifically? Um, how she had gotten to know Miss Taylor. Mm-hmm. And how she had just gone through life with her. Yeah, and how Miss Taylor took care of her. Right. Right? It's been like she, she had illnesses in childhood, and she was always you know, playing with her, amused her in health, you know. Okay. And it says, a large debt of gratitude was owing here. What does that mean? Um, that she, she um, felt the need to give back. Yeah, she felt grateful. A large debt of, of gratitude. She's very, very thankful. Okay. Keep reading, please. Okay. But the intercourse of the last seven years, the equal footing and perfect unreserve which had soon followed Isabella's marriage on their being left to each other was yet a dear, tender recollection. Okay, a couple things here. Let's start with the vocab. First, we've got to recognize, so the word intercourse here has a very different meaning than probably the more common usage of the word intercourse today. Let's recognize that. Yeah. I'm not going to get into what it means today, but here in this context here, it just means intera <laughs> interaction. Okay. The interaction. Of the last seven years. Yes. Okay. The equal footing and perfect unreserve, which had soon followed Il Isabella's marriage on their being left to each other, was yet a dear, tender recollection. What does that mean? Um, it's kind of like... I'm not really sure what it's saying here. Two things are being compared here. Two things are being compared here. She has these memories of being taken care of when she was a child, right, in the earlier part of the paragraph. Right. right. Like being in line 55. She recalled her past kindness as the kindness affection of 16 years when she was taken care of as a child. And then it says, but the intercourse of the last seven years, the equal footing, right, which means like the equality they had, basically, right? They treat each other as oh, like friend to friend, right? And the perfect unreserve, which had soon followed Isabel's, Isabel's marriage on their being left to each other. So like, they have a very open relationship. Have you, do you have any friends? Have you ever had a friendship where, like, you can just speak your mind? Like, whatever pops into your head, you can just speak your mind exactly as you think. Yeah. No reservations. That's awesome. I mean, you're very, you're like, consider yourself blessed to have, be able to have a friend like that. That's awesome. That's one yeah. of the best things there is in life. For and sure. um, and, uh, and that's what she's referencing there. Perfect unreserved, which had soon followed Isabella's marriage on their being left to each other, was yet a dear, tender recollection than what? Than um, the past. Than even like the, yeah, the, the earlier past. Right? right. When she was taken care of as a child. So she's just kind of just remembering her friendship. Right? Because that's all she has left now. Because Miss Taylor's yeah. gone. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. That's tough. That's tough. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot going on. But again, that's an example. you got to stop and kind of reread. And I mean, first make sure you got the vocab down. But, you know, chewing those ideas. Okay, what could be could be the author, what's the author trying to communicate here with that? And the, and the author's making a comparison between those two stages of memory, the early childhood and then the more recent memories of the past seven years. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, great. Let's take it from line 65. It had been a friend. All right. It had been a friend and companion, such as few possessed, intelligent, well-informed, useful, gentle, knowing all the ways of the family, interested in all its concerns, and what is that? What word is that? Sound, sound that out. 
uh, pecu- oh, peculiar. Yeah, it, it's, it's tough to it. it's tough to sound. It's tough to pronounce peculiarly. Peculiarly, that is tough in a peculiar way. Is what I mean, right? Peculiarly, right? <laughs> Interested in herself and every pleasure, every scheme of hers, one to whom she could speak every thought as it arose, and who had such an affection for her as it could never find fault. She's a great friend, or was a great yeah. friend, right? That's it. Any questions about that? Um, no. No. Okay, great. Like right now, I'm um, reading Pride and Prejudice, and I've noticed that Jane Austen loves to restate stuff in different ways. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pride and Prejudice is good, man. I totally. I was supposed to read that in school. I never read it. I wrote essays on it. Have you seen the six-hour like A and E version of Pride and Prejudice? I have not. Dude, it is a masterpiece. You need to see it. I'm serious. Right. It is one it is some of the best TV that there is. It's like Colin Firth and there's a couple other famous actors in there. And um, uh, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I never thought, and that's why I kind of fell in love with Jane Austen was actually was watching the movie. I know you're supposed to read the book first and then watch the movie, but I saw the movie <laughs> first. And uh, But like, it's brilliant. And it is so funny. It is hilarious. <laughs> Um, and it really, and it looks like if just on the surface, it looks like boring, like, you know, PBS, like masterpiece theater. Like I couldn't care less about that stuff normally, but it is so brilliant. Um, give, check that out after you read the book. Okay. Maybe, maybe you might actually yeah. want to watch the movie and then read the book. Cause you'll, I think you'll appreciate the book more. Um, check it out though. And I encourage that anybody else watching that. The a e version of Pride and Prejudice is brilliant, but that's slightly off topic. Let's keep reading from line 73. Okay. How was she going to bear the change? It was true that her friend was going only half a mile from them, but Emma was aware that great must be the difference between a Miss Weston only half a mile from them and a Miss Taylor in the house. All right, all right. What is, what, is, what is that? What's going on there? What is the author saying there? In that part of the passage. Um, she, she's kind of like saying that the, there's a, she feels a big difference in between the people almost. Hang on, how am I? Read it again if you need to. Read it again. Take it again from line 73. How is she going to bear the change? It was true that her friend was going only half a mile from them, but Emma was aware that great must be the difference between a Miss Weston only half a mile from them and a Miss Taylor in the house. All right. So she's, she feels like it's a longer like distance. Yeah. Than- yeah. Yeah. She's only moving half a mile away. Right. But she might as well be 100 miles away. Why? She just misses having her around. She's not around anymore. And why isn't... Yeah, I mean, she's married now, right? Yeah. So her responsibilities are going to be to her husband and her household, not to Emma. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you see how you're able to figure that out when you just reread it? Yeah. Sometimes you just got to chew on language a little bit. That's okay. Yeah. But if you find yourself reading something, you're like, wait, what? Go back and reread it. Go back and reread it. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's how you understand language. Yeah, for sure. Right? You gotta, sometimes you got to chew on ideas a little bit. Consider what's possible, what makes sense, what there's evidence for. Okay. All right, let's keep going from line 77. And with all her advantages... And with all her advantages, natural and domestic, she was now in great danger of suffering from intellectual solitude. She dearly loved her father, but he was in no comparison for her. What was that? What oh, was no, that? I just totally read that wrong. <laughs> but he was no companion for her. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's going on here? Um, it's so it, it's, um, stating how how she's feeling and then how she loves her father, but... He's not the same. Not the same as what? You're right. You're right. As uh, Miss Taylor. Yeah. They don't have the same relationship. They're not nearly as close. Yeah. Yeah. Read that last line, line 81. He could not meet her. He could not meet her in conversation, rational or playful. What does that mean, rational or playful? Um, like, a, like a serious conversation uh-huh. or just joking. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Just being like clever and witty or just like having a serious conversation on a serious topic. Couldn't do either. Yeah, he's kind of hands off. 
Yeah, that's yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're just not, he's just not the same, just doesn't mean you're on the same level. They're on two different levels. Right. You know what I'm saying? And she's, you know, on a, on a higher level. Right. Um, yeah. At least intellectually. So, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. Last paragraph. Okay. The evil of the actual disparity in their ages, and Mr. Wood house had not married early was much increased by his constitution and habits. All right, I gotta stop, I gotta stop, I gotta stop. We've got to talk some vocab here. Disparity. Okay. All right, and well, we see evil first, right? Again, you just mean the same problem. It's not like, you know, you know, Hitler evil here, right? Just the problem. Yeah. Okay. Well, the actual disparity in their ages. What does disparity mean? Um, there's a big difference. There's a big difference. That's all disparity means. The difference. In their ages, and this is also too. Like, you know, when you're taking the actual test, you know, you're not going to have a you know dictionary in front of you. You're not going to be able to do a Google search. Like, what word could you plug into that would make sense? You know what I'm saying? Y yeah, you're going to have to kind of figure it out based on the context on the actual test, and and uh, you know, difference makes perfect sense, and that's what it means. The actual difference in their ages, and it says, and Mr. Woodhouse had not married early, which means what? Um, that. Wait. He had yeah, Mr. Woodhouse totally had not married thought. early. Which means what? He was not um, young when he married. No, he was old. He was old when he got married. Okay. Right. And that actual disparity, that difference, was much increased by his constitution and habits. Okay. Now, that word constitution is an interesting word. All right. I know you're familiar with the word constitution, but probably in the context of government. Right. Right. The U.S. Constitution, whatever. Here, Constitution, really, a better synonym would be health. Mm. Health or makeup. What he's made of. Right. Which, is, by the way, that's where we get, that's what Constitution means. What, what something is constituted of. What it's made up of. And our uh, Constitution, like in the U.S. Constitution, right, it tells you what our government is made of. The structure of the government. You got three branches of government. You got a president. You got a Congress. You got courts. And here's the relation between how it works, what it's made up of. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. So Constitution is actually a, a, a synonym for health. Gotcha. So what is the author saying here? That the actual disparity of their ages was much increased by his constitution and habits. What does that mean? That um, they were not similar. They well, didn't have much in common. Well, there's, well uh, it's more specific than that. The evil of the actual disparity in their ages. And Mr. Woodhouse had not married early was much increased by his constitution and habits. What's the idea there? Um, is it saying that he's not healthy? It's implying that. But there's a really specific idea. Something is being increased. His, their, the difference in their the ages. The difference in their ages is much increased by his constitution or his health and his habits. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yes. So there's, there's already a difference in their ages. But because of his health and his habits, like we're talking about him going to bed early, right? After, right? Oh, right. dinner time. Time to go to bed, right? <laughs> and it's suggesting his, his, got, his health isn't great. I'm just going to talk about that in just a minute. But that increases the difference between their already different ages. Does right. that make sense? Yes. Do you see the difference there between so like trying to make a guess about what's going on and like figuring out based on the evidence, based on the language, what the author's saying? Yeah. And there's, there's, there's an important difference here. A lot of students are used to reading and just getting impressions. You know what I mean when I say getting impressions? Yes. Like you're able to kind of pick up bits and pieces here and there and then you're trying to, but you're only getting some of the pieces but you try to put them together into a puzzle and make a picture in your head. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And sometimes it's maybe accurate, sometimes maybe less accurate, probably less accurate. But you don't have to do that. You can figure out exactly what the author's saying. I mean, like, ask yourself the question, okay, what is doing what? <laughs> right? right. And in this case, the disparity in their ages, the difference in their ages, is being increased by his yeah. health and his habits. Okay. That's a specific idea. Right? Not just that, like, they're different people. Okay, well, yeah. But you can figure out the language. Okay? Yeah. All right. Let's keep reading. Line 85.
for having been a valetudinarian all his life, without activity of mind or body, he was a much older man in ways than in years. Ooh, interesting. Okay, okay, okay. Real quick. So they actually define this word for us. Every once in a while, you see this on the SAT or PSAT, where they actually give you a definition. It's a very obscure word. All right. I never heard the word yeah, valet. Like, nobody knows this. Word. Yeah, no, yeah, well, yeah. Good luck with that one. Yeah. And 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 uh, and that's the case here. Okay, tell me what is, what's a valetudinarian? What's the definition here? A person in weak health who's overly concerned with his or her ailment. Yes, yeah, today we'd probably call them a hypochondriac. Somebody gotcha. that's obsessed with their health or with their their health problems to an unhealthy degree. Yeah. It sounds like valetorian. I like to make a joke that I was the valetudinarian of my graduating class in college, um, which is a bad joke, not very funny, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, I did get sick a bit in college, but, uh, but anyway, so, um, but yeah, he's, he's, he's like a hypochondriac. Okay. Now, what does it mean here when it says, uh, for having been a valet valetudinarian all his life without activity or minor body, he was a much older man in ways that in years. What does that mean? He was a much older man in ways that in um, it's saying that he wasn't, like, old, but he seemed like he was much older than he actually is. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say he's not old, because, you know, it says here he hadn't married early. So right. he's probably old. But he seems even older. Yeah, he's, like, not doing too well. He's not too well. No. No. He's old, but he seems really old. Yeah. Okay? Does that make sense? He's a yes. much older man in ways... Than in years. It's not saying he's not old. He's old. He just acts even older. Okay. Okay. All right. Go and finish that off. All right. And though everywhere beloved for the friendliness of his heart and his amiable temper, his talents could not have recommended him at any time. Ooh, his amiable temper. Everywhere beloved for the friendliness of his heart and his amiable temper. What does amiable mean? Um. Is it like? Various temporal temper. Yeah, look it up. Like, look it up. Look it up. Amiable definition. Okay. Amiable. You can spell that here. <laughs> okay. Um, having or displaying a friendly and pleasant manner. Ah, friendly. Friendly. Do you want to say friend in Spanish? You know this. Please tell me. Uh, amigo. 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 Amiable means friendly. Comes from the same root Latin word. Gotcha. Yeah. That makes sense. Yep. And then we see the word temper again, right? Like personality. Right? Right. So it says, for uh, he's beloved for his friendliness of his heart and his amiable temper. His talents could not have recommended him at any time. What the author means there is his talents could not have recommended him socially. Anytime, mm. like he's a nice guy, but like that's it. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're like oh yeah, he's a real nice guy. Okay, <laughs> all right, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and he's just not on the same level as Emma. Yeah, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Any questions about this? Um, no. Okay. Sometimes I have students. You know, when I'm working one on one with them, I'll have them like reread. The past after we've discussed everything and, and analyzed the vocab and everything, I'll um, reread it again. And and I might encourage you to do that. We're gonna take a break here in just a, just a minute. Um, I don't, I don't want to spend the time doing that right now. But if you did that, I promise, like you just, it would all make perfect sense. But it would, yeah, it would flow a lot better. It would all make sense. And um, but if you read, you know, if you do it like a quick read, you know, like read it on a time test, like two minutes, two and a half minutes, whatever. Like it's just it's the vocab is just complicated. The syntax is complicated. It's just tough. It's tough. But you can't do it timed until you can do it untimed first. And so, right. so you just have to you have to approach text this way. You have to look up the words. You have got to chew on the language. And if you're not doing that, you're you're not reading well. Again, you're just kind of like swimming in that like world of impressions that may or may not be accurate. And I'll be honest, are generally not. Right. Because this author, every author is communicating specific ideas. And if you're just zipping through it, you're, you're, you're not understanding the ideas being communicated. And you're going to struggle on this whole section. Okay? Okay. All right. Let's take a um, 
a little three minute break. Uh, right. I'm gonna get some more coffee and go to the restroom. I encourage you to do the same. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about approaching these questions based on evidence in the text. All right? Okay. All right. See you in a minute, Katie. See you. All right. Bye. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to SAT Reading Crash Course Day 1. We're in Part 2. We got Caden with us. We just finished uh, reading that uh, first passage from PSAT Practice Test Number 1, uh, that Jane Austen passage from Emma. And uh, if you haven't given it a, a read through on your own yet, I, I, I recommend uh, trying that at some point. Uh, just read it all the way through on your own after having discussed it. I don't want to spend the time doing that right now, but uh, we're going to approach some of these questions here. And I want to go to um, I want to go to the rules for reading here, um, starting with rule number three. Ken, can you see that? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Go ahead and read. Uh, Rule number three, we've already done one and two, looking up words you don't know, we've got to know that vocab, and then reading for meaning, not just rushing through the text, but slowing down and really chewing on the ideas. Uh, rule number three applies to answering the questions. So, go ahead and read rule number three for us, please, loud and proud. Okay. Look for evidence in the text to support the correct answer choice and to eliminate incorrect answer choices. You never need to bring in your opinion or think about what might sound reasonable. Focus on the text. Yeah, this is real different from like uh, most English classes, I think, where they like ask you kind of like, how does this make you feel? What does this make you think about? You know, you're supposed to make associations and connections on your own. And and that's really not the name of the game at all here on the SAT. Um, the question is always basically, what is the author saying? That's it. And so the answers to all the questions are within the text themselves. So, you know, I sometimes describe um, the reading section as more like, where's Waldo? than a traditional English test. And when I say, where's Waldo? you played Where's Waldo before, have you, Caden? Yes. Right, where you're like, trying to, you know, it's Waldo somewhere in the picture, you gotta kind of scan through and you know, visually process things, try to find where Waldo is. It's a little bit like that. The right. answer is there, somewhere in the text, hidden somewhere in the text. You just gotta find it. Okay? Right. So get out of your head and get in the text. That's the name of the game here. Now you gotta use your brain obviously to figure out what the text is saying. But your focus needs to be on the text. Not about what you think sounds right or like, yeah, that's how I might feel if I were in that situation or something. None of that. Focus on what the author is saying in the text. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, great. So let's do it. Go ahead and read question number one first, uh, please. You see it there on the screen? All right. The main purpose of the passage is to... Okay, okay. Now, before we answer this, um, a lot of the questions you're going to see on the... On the uh, SAT or PSAT for that matter. The first question in a passage is quite often, not always, but quite often is what I describe as an overarching question. Okay, this is the main purpose of the passage as a whole. Does that make sense when I say overarching question? Yes. You gotta consider the whole thing. They're asking about a very specific part. Most of the questions they're asking about a very specific part. I mean, you know, I look at like questions three and four and five, they're asking you about specific sets of lines. Here they're asking you about the passage as a whole. This is a good question. If you read the answer choices and you're not sure about the answer, it's a good question to kind of skip, circle and skip it, and then come back to it after, you, after you've answered all the other questions that require you to study the specific parts of the passage, right? The rest of gotcha. it. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yes. Because after you've answered the other questions, like, you know, two through nine on the more specific parts of the passage, you're going to have a better understanding of the passage as a whole. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. But here, I want to try it. I want to see if we can answer this. Sometimes if you have a good understanding of the passage, you can answer it right away. Great. You don't have to worry about skipping and coming back to it. So let's try to answer it right now. We may come back to it, depending. But I think based on our close reading, I think you're going to have a good sense of, of um, what the answer is. And again, we're going to continue our focus on evidence in the text. If we can support that with evidence or eliminate the answer choice with evidence in the text as well. So the main purpose of the passage is to go ahead and read answer choice A, please. Describe a main character and a significant change in her life. Okay. Is the main purpose of the passage to describe a main character and a significant change in her life? Um, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it does that. <laughs> okay, right? I mean, like, is that kind of obvious after reading it as close right. as yeah, we did, sure. right? Like, okay, that's that seems like the main purpose. Let's At the very least, let's keep it. Okay? Yeah. But that sounds pretty good. Let's test answer choice B. Go ahead and read answer choice B. Provide an overview of a family and a nearby neighbor. Okay, Caden, is the main purpose of the passage to provide an overview of a family and a nearby neighbor? Um, I mean, it provides an overview. It's a family. It but does that. She's only a neighbor 
towards the end, she was kind of the family. Yeah. It doesn't really add up. Yeah, I agree. 100%. I agree, right? And you're absolutely right. Like, based on the evidence, you can eliminate that. I mean, she's a neighbor at the end. But that's it. Right. And it's not even really so much about the family. It's not the main purpose. Yeah. it's it's They do that. But it's not the main – absolutely, it's not the main purpose. Does that make sense? Yes. But you can eliminate that based on the evidence. Right? It's more about Emma and less about the family. Anyway. So, yeah, I don't like B. We can get rid of it. Try C. Okay. Um, discuss some regrettable personality flaws in a main character. Okay. Is that the main purpose of the passage, to discuss some regrettable personality flaws in a main character? No. No. Now, does it do that? Does it regret uh, discuss some regrettable personality flaws in a main character? Yes. Absolutely. Right? But that's only, that's only like, parts of the passage. I mean, that's, like, lines like... I don't know, like around line 30 maybe. and Right. Uh, I mean, that's most of it. That's it. But it's yeah, just like a small that. part. And right? it also goes over some good personality. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a small part of it. it. It may be a true statement that it does discuss some regrettable personality flaws, but it's not the main purpose of the passage. And here you got to directly address the question. So I think we can only right. see. Any questions about that? Uh, no. Okay, and that's tricky here. It's not just, is that a true statement? It's, is that the main purpose of the passage? You always have to keep the question in mind when you test the answer choices. So we can get rid of C. Try D. Okay, explain the relationship between a main character and her father. Is that the main purpose of the passage? No. No. Now, hold on. Does the passage explain the relationship between a main character and her father? Yes. Yes, it does, but that's not the main purpose of the passage. Yep. Is that clear? Yes. We can... Confirm answer choice A, and we can eliminate answer choice B, C, and D. We can feel pretty good about answer choice yeah. A, and it is A. Okay. But I want you to do both things. I want you to test all the answer choices. You should read them all. You'll have time to. You will. Okay. Um, but if you can do both those things, if you can confirm the right answer based on evidence from the text, yes, the whole text is either describing the main character or describing the significant change in her life. The whole text is doing that. You can check it all out. Test it. And you can eliminate the incorrect answer as B, C, and D. Based on evidence in the text, you've got the right answer. And we do here. Any questions? Um, no. Okay, great. Question number two. Go and read that for me, please. Okay. Which choice best summarizes the first two paragraphs of the passage, line 1 through 14? Okay, now, before we answer this question, guess what we're going to have to do? Um, look at the text. We're going to have to look at the text. We're going to have to reread those first two paragraphs, lines 1 through 14. We have to. Okay. Now, when we're doing a timed test, and we'll get to that later. You know, we'll spend some time at the end of the course, you know, discussing exactly how to approach time testing. Um, you know, what I generally recommend is that you give the passage a good quick read, like two to three minutes, probably max. Um, and just kind of get the main ideas. And then when they ask you to reference a specific part of the passage, you go back and study it very, very carefully. Okay. Okay. Because if they're asking you a specific question about a specific part of the passage, you better understand that specific part of the passage. So right. if they ask you, to, if they reference a specific set of lines, you just have to go back. You have to. Okay. So let's do that right here. Okay. Uh, so we're going to read the first two paragraphs again, but I think we're going to have a pretty good understanding of these um, now that we've we've analyzed it as we have. Go ahead and read it uh, from from the beginning. That first two. Okay. Paragraphs. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence, and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. She was the youngest of the two daughters of a most affectionate, indulgent father, and had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, been mistress of, her, of his house from a very early period. Her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses, and her place had been supplied by an excellent woman as governess, who had fallen little short of a mother in affection. Excellent. Okay, great. Now let's answer the question. So we got to find which best summarizes the first two paragraphs of the passage. Go ahead and read A, please. Even though a character loses a parent at an early age, she is happily raised in a loving home. Does that summarize the first two paragraphs of the passage? Um, sort of. Sort of. Why do you say sort of? I don't think it touches on what the... Like, I think the, the first two paragraphs kind of go more broad than that. How so? Like, I don't know. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, like, say that it isn't 
saying what the first few paragraphs is, but I wouldn't say that. You're not sold on it. it could, yeah. You're not sold on it. Okay. If you're not sold on it, can you eliminate it? Uh, I wouldn't say you could eliminate it. I wouldn't say you can eliminate it either. Right. I wouldn't say. You may not be sold on it. And notice it doesn't say, which is the perfect summary of the first two paragraphs. Oh, yeah. Right? Does it? We just got to go with the best one. If you can't eliminate it, don't eliminate it. Let's keep okay. it. See if we can find something better. Let's keep it. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. You, you, you really only should eliminate if you can find evidence against it. I don't see any evidence against it at the moment. Now, if, if we're between like two other answer choices and, and you, you know, you're, if, if you're left with two, you can't eliminate two, there's probably something you're missing and you can go back and try to figure out kind of what you're missing. But if you can't eliminate, don't eliminate it. Let's keep it. Go to read B. An affectionate governess helps a character to overcome the loss of her mother despite the indifference of her father. Does that summarize the first two paragraphs of the passage? Um, I wouldn't. <laughs> no, I'm second guessing myself on everything. Well, focus on the evidence. You don't. You don't. You don't. Your your opinion doesn't really need to get into this at all. I mean, do you know what indifference means? Um. Yeah, like he, he's like it would mean like he's really not caring here. Not caring. Think. Yeah, not yeah. caring. Disinterested, uncaring. Is her father? But I, I think it. I is, think it mentioned that he did like care. Let's go to the text. Is her father indifferent? Uh, let's see. Look at the text. Most, most affectionate, indulgent father. Is he indifferent? No. So, no. No. He's not indifferent. All right. Now you got to know what indifferent means. And here again, doing untimed work. I encourage you to look up the vocab, even the vocab in, and maybe especially the vocab in the answer choices. This is still needs. This still needs to be an opportunity for you to boost your academic vocabulary because you're going to see academic vocabulary all over this test. You just got to know what words mean, right? And we know if you know what different means. I'm kidding. He's not indifferent. He's affectionate yeah. and indulgent. Not indifferent. Does that make sense? Yes. So we can eliminate B just based on that one word, indifference. Just based on that. Yeah. But I got another issue with answer choice B. Does this governess help the character overcome the loss of her mother? No. No. Why not? We can base that on evidence in the text. Why not? Why yeah, do we she, know? she didn't know her enough to <laughs> really worry or care about it. There was, there was no loss for her to get over because she doesn't even remember her mother hardly. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. That's two strikes against answer choice B. We've got yeah, evidence. Not looking too good. <laughs> it's not looking good. Do you see that? And and do you see why? Like, don't don't second guess yourself. Your your thoughts don't matter. <laughs> they just don't. Your impressions don't matter. They just don't. What's the author saying? Does the governess help the character overcome the loss of her mother? No. There's evidence against that because she doesn't even remember her mother. Does that make sense? Yes. Is her father indifferent? No. No. He's affectionate and indulgent. Not different. Your thoughts don't come in, in, into this at all. Now, and it's tricky, right? Because you're like, boy, if I lost my mom at an early age, I might be, you know, you know, and you're thinking about, you know, if you lost your mother or something like that. You know, of course you would be yeah. sad. But there's just no evidence that Emma had to overcome anything. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that she didn't deal with any problems. Right? Yeah. There's more evidence even in, in the first paragraph. She lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. Even the death of her mother didn't distress her. Because she was too young to remember it. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. It's all about evidence in the text. There's just no evidence for B, and there's a lot of evidence against it. So B is gone for sure. Do you see the difference between A and B, by the way? Yeah. And for a while, you're kind of torn between the two, kind of when you're focused on your impressions, maybe, or about how you would feel. Or something oh, like yeah. That. You know? Well, that's not it, man. That's not the But It's just like, there's at least there's some evidence for A, and you can't get rid of it. But B, no, 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 and no. When you focus on the text. Any questions? Um... No. Okay. Go to read answer C. Largely as a result of her father's wealth and affection, a character leads a contented life. Hmm. Does that summarize the first two paragraphs of the passage? Um, no. I agree, no. Why not? The father doesn't play a big enough role in it. I think it's Sorry. more than that. I mean, is her father wealthy and affectionate? Yeah. Yeah. So what's wrong with C? 
that wasn't the reason, the main reason why she led Ex- a kinship life. Exactly, exactly. Right, that word largely, which means like mostly. I mean, is that a factor? Yes. Not probably, but is that is that largely the reason? I don't see any evidence for that. No. I just don't. Yeah, she's rich. Okay, great. Comfortable home. Okay. I mean, is it largely because of her father's wealth and affection? There's no. not good evidence for it. Do you see that? Yeah. One word can throw off an answer choice. One word. And that's yeah, the case sure. here with answer choice C, largely. Okay. And it just doesn't, it just doesn't summarize. The, I mean, it's part of it, kind of, his wealth and affection. Maybe, but it's not largely. Okay. One word can throw it off. Go to answer choice D. A character has a generally comfortable and fulfilling life, but then she must recover from losing her mother. And that's not, that's just, not what happens. No, no, it's just not what happens, right? And again, we see the issue there, right? She doesn't have to recover from her mother's loss because she barely right. it. So we've got evidence against B. So it's A. Yeah. Is it A perfect? No. Does it best summarize the first two paragraphs of the passage? Does it yes. best? It does. So it's that, right? Be aware of that. You're never, you know, rarely going to find, oh, that's perfect. You know, maybe sometimes. Yeah. But we got to find the best, which means the least worst. And there's big problems yeah. with B, C, and D. Does that make sense? Yes. I think it's easier to eliminate bad answer choices than it is to confirm the right one. Yeah, for sure. I think always. Always. Yeah, it's, it's a lot more... Um... Oh, it's the word I'm looking it's for. Just, it's just it's more obvious to be like, yeah. no, that's not right. Then to be like, yeah. that's it, right there. That's it, you know? You read it and you're like, maybe? I don't know. That's yeah. fine, keep it. But when you read like, you know, D? <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's not what Definitely happened. not, <laughs> right? Yeah. you got to use process of elimination. But we can do both. We can confirm A. I mean, it does that, it summarizes that. Well, not perfectly, but it does that. That definitely doesn't do B, C, and D. Yeah. Okay. Question number three. Okay. The narrator indicates that the particular nature of Emma's upbringing resulted in her being. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Resulted in her being. Hmm. Okay. Um, so we've got, we've got some answer choices here. So, go to answer choice A. Despondent. Despondent. You know what despondent means? Do not know what that means. You've got to know what words mean. Go ahead and look it up. Despondent definition. I mean, I'm sure I've heard it before. I just Probably. In low spirits from loss of hope or courage. Okay. Does the narrator indicate that the particular nature of Emma's upbringing results in her being despondent? No. No. What's your evidence against that? I agree. There's lots of evidence against it. It seems like she's very well off and happy. Yeah, she's happy, right? She's lived, uh, again, those those lines, you know, around line five, right? She's lived 21 years with very little to distress or vex her. She's, she's not despondent. She's the opposite. She's pretty happy. Yeah. Right? But that's tough to eliminate if you don't know what despondent means. And that's okay. If you see where you don't know, again, especially on the time test, you're taking the actual SAT, you know, keep it. Don't eliminate it. If you don't know, at least it's a possibility, but. But, uh, you know, when you do an untimed work, use this as an opportunity to boost your academic vocab. Look it up. Okay. All right. Go to uh, read B for me, please. Self-satisfied. Does the narrator indicate that the particular nature of Emma's upbringing resulted in her being self-satisfied? Yeah. I think so. What's your evidence for that? I mean, that's kind of how it, it went over. It was like she was very, um, I don't know how they worded it exactly, but they said that she was very... Um, well off. Yeah. Do you know what self-satisfied means? Um, content. It's a little bit more than that. It's a little bit more than that. Go ahead and look up self-satisfied. Self-satisfied definition. Go to Google that. It's more specific than that. I mean, you could say it means, you know, obviously you're satisfied with yourself. Okay. There's a connotation there that I want you to understand. Um, excessively and unwarrantedly satisfied with oneself or one's achievements. Ooh, it's got a very negative connotation. Excessively 
satisfied with oneself. Almost egotistical. Almost egotistical. Do you see any evidence that uh, the narrator indicates the particular nature of her upbringing results in her being self-satisfied, excessively um, satisfied I would say herself? so. Can you think of any lines? Um, I believe it was around maybe line 30. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Read that sentence around line 30. Start oh, yeah. In the paragraph. Read that. The real evils of, indeed, in a situation where the power of having rather too much her own way in a disposition to think a little too well of herself. Does that sound like self-satisfied? Yes. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay, so we've got good evidence for that. So B looks pretty good. Let's test the others. Try C. Okay. Friendless. Okay, does the narrator indicate the particular nature of Emma's upbringing results in her being friendless? Um, well, she wasn't friendless. She wasn't friendless. Yeah, so she felt friendless at the end after yeah, she left, but yeah. that wasn't really that wasn't a result of her upbringing. upbringing. Yeah, her upbringing like she had a really good friend who. Yeah, <laughs> who? So who? Who was uh, her friend? Oh, um, Miss Taylor. Miss Taylor. Who's not friendly? Oh, sh get rid of C. That's ridiculous. What about D? Inconsiderate. Mm. Um. I wouldn't say that. No. Like, she seemed like that. No, in fact, she's very considerate. How do we know she's considerate? Yeah. Because she cares for her friend. She cares for her friend, right? So much that, so that, like, she encourages her to get married, even though it's going to negatively affect her. Right. Right? That she's at least aware of on some level, I would think. So you're very considerate, right? There's the whole lines about her thinking about, you know, how much she wished and promoted the match. Right? Yeah. On, like, line 53, 54. 53. So it's not D. So even if you're stuck between like, let's say you can't get rid of A because you don't know what that means, and there's some evidence for B, you can get rid of C and D. If it's between A and B, what are you going to go with? Go with the, the one, one that you have go evidence, in the, for. evidence for, right? I mean, it could be A, but you don't know what it means, but we know we got evidence for B. Go with B. Yeah. Does that make sense? You, yes. You, you know, especially when you're taking the actual SAT, you got to focus on what you know, not what you don't know. Now, when you're doing untimed work, you got to recognize what you don't know and find it out. You got to know what words mean. Yes. On the actual test, emphasize what you know, and you'll be okay. Okay. All right. Oh, look at question number four. I love this. Go and read question number four for us, please. Okay. Which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? You don't even need to read the lines. You can tell me right now. Um, D. Hmm. Well, let's read D, okay. 32 through 34. Oh, I totally missed that. <laughs> I missed it by like one line. You're, you're close. Look at the answer choices for four. It's C. C, 28 through, I mean, those are the lines you read, right? Right. 28 through 32. I, I couldn't remember if it was from line 31 to 32. Yeah, yeah, they're super close. They're super close. But right. go ahead and read, read 28 through 32 again. Okay. The real evil is indeed of Emma's situation where the power of having rather too much her own way and disposition to think a little too well of herself. These were the disadvantages which threatened alloy to her many enjoyments. Do we see why that supports the idea of her being self-satisfied? Yes. Read 32 through 34 now. I don't think it supports it as much. Okay. Uh, the danger, however, was at present so unperceived that they did not by any means rank as misfortunes with her. Do you see why C's better? Yes. And C hits it head on. Yeah, it's much clearer. He kind of hints at it a little bit. That's a little bit tricky. But again, like when I asked you for the evidence, that's, those are the lines you read. It was from 20 through 32, at least 20 through 30. Right? Does that make yeah. sense? Yes. So here's the deal. They love these style questions where they ask you a question and then you have to support it with specific lines. Okay? If you know the answer to three and you can find the lines to support it, you know the answer to four. Does that make sense? Right. I, yes. call, them, I call them two for one questions. Because if you're answering three well, you've already found the answer to number four. Now, here's the deal, Caden. It's important. If you read three and you're not sure about the answer to three, what should you do? Um, check the next one. Check the next one. Look through the lines. Look it. through the yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Because yes. the answer to three has to be in the lines in answer choices A, B, C, or D from question four. It right. has to be there. So you don't have to read through the whole passage to find the answer to three. Just read the lines in question number four. Does that make sense? Yes. And I go back and forth all the time. 
when I'm answering these two for one questions. And I, I think students should do is should do the same as well. If you know the answer to three, great. Just answer it and support with evidence, and then you know four. But if you read three and you're unsure about it, go to four. Read the lines. You should find the answer to number three and four. Okay. Okay. Any questions? No. No. Okay. Great. Question number five. Go ahead and read it for me, please. All right. As used in line 26, directed most nearly means... Okay, now I'm going to stop you real quick. Notice it doesn't say, directed most nearly means. I mean, it does say it, that's not all it says. It says, as used in line 26. Right. Directed most nearly means. So we're not just looking for a synonym for directed. We're looking for the meaning of the word directed in line 26. So what you have to do here, Caden, this is very, very important. Um, you've got to plug in the answer choices into the sentence where line 26 is at. Okay. Okay. The correct answer choice is going to make perfect sense. And the incorrect answer choices aren't going to make much sense. You've got right. to use that method. You've got to plug it into the sentence. Okay. So let's do that. So let's read, um, we're going to test answer choice A, trained. And we're going to plug that in for directed okay. into the sentence where line 26 is at. So read, take it from, uh. Just take it from, you know, we got a semicolon here. It's a complete statement here after the semicolon. Okay. Just take it from line 25. Highly steaming, Miss Taylor's judgment. And I think we're plugging in trained, in for directed. Sure. Does that make sense? Do you okay. see where we are? Right here? Yes. Okay, good. Go ahead and read from highly steaming. Highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but trained chiefly by her own. How's that? That fits pretty well, Okay. I would say. Let's try answer choice B. Okay, aimed. Uh, highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but aimed chiefly by her own. How's that? That doesn't fit no. as well, in my opinion. No, it doesn't make a ton of sense. Okay. No, it doesn't really hit the same way. Try C, guided. Okay. Highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but guided chiefly by her own. How's that? That fits, that fits. pretty well. What's better, A or C? I would say C because it's like she respects her judgment so much, but she still favors hers a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. She's she's she esteems Miss Taylor's judgment. She respects Miss Taylor's judgment, but she's guided chiefly by her own judgment. Does it make sense yeah. you say? It, but she's trained chiefly by her own judgment. Does that make sense? Yes. If you say trained. If you, oh, could you? Be, oh, that well, that doesn't it doesn't fit as well. It's it, like I don't think it does. trained chiefly by your own. It would be like you're training. Like, yeah, could you like, be trained by your judgment? You could be guided by your own judgment, but would you yeah. be trained by your own judgment? Not so much. I don't think that makes much sense. I don't. And this is a great example of where you need to cycle through all the answer choices. Even you thought you found something good with A, right? But C's right. better. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so don't just stop when you see something good. You've always got to cycle through. Always. Try and choice B, addressed. Okay. Um, highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but addressed chiefly by her own. How's that? It's not, that's not happening. No, no, um, not happening. It happen. doesn't flow. No, no, you're not addressed by your own judgment. That's weird. Yeah, that doesn't really You can be sense. guided by your judgment. You're not addressed, you're not trained by your judgment. Certainly not. What was the other one? Aimed by your own judgment. So the best answer is yeah. Answer choice C. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. You got to plug them in. You got to plug them in and cycle through. Okay. Okay. Question number six. Same thing. Go ahead and read question number six. All right. As used in line fifty-four, want most nearly means. Okay. We got to plug in the answer choices here. Okay. So let's plug okay. in answer choice A, which is desire. We're gonna plug that into the sentence where line fifty-four is at. So, right here, you see that sentence? Mm -hmm. Which sentence? Line 54. The want of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour of every day. So plug in desire. Oh, desire. The desire of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour, every day. How's that? I mean, it fits pretty well. Like, okay. she desires to be around her. Okay. Let's try answer choice B. Lack. Lack. Okay, so we'll plug that into that sentence. Okay. The lack of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour of every day. 
How's that? I would say that fits better. That does fit better. Why is B better than A? Why is lack better than want or than desire? Because it shows that it, it kind of sets the, the tone of how she's not there. It really sets that in picture. It's like, oh, she's not around. Yeah, if you plug in A, the desire of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour of every day. Whose desire are we talking about if you plug in A? Um, I don't know if it's specified, but probably the main Emma. I mean, the author is trying to communicate. We're talking about Emma's desire for Miss Taylor. Right. But if you plug in desire in place of want, it's something to be talking about the desire of Miss Taylor, not the desire of Emma. Uh, yeah. Do you see that? Yes. A gives you the wrong idea. Yeah, it does. It throws, throws you off. Yeah, it's not Miss Taylor's desire. It's Emma's desire for Miss Taylor. And that's the right. idea you communicate if you plug in lack. The lack of Miss Taylor. The fact that Miss Taylor's not there would be felt every hour of every day by Emma. But if you plug right. in A, it seems like we're talking about Miss Taylor's desire. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about Emma's desire for Miss Taylor. There's a difference there. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, and this is why you got to plug in the answer choices. You wouldn't believe the percentage of students that pick A for question number six. Probably like 90%. Wow. Because when they when they read it at first, they say, as you use line fifty four, want most of them is like, oh, want means desire, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's a synonym. They love doing that. They love giving you the obvious synonym, especially for answer choice A. You don't uh, see so it you all. Just, yeah, just and everybody's just like, oh, desire. <laughs> I know what that means. Easy. Yeah. Wrong. <laughs> eh. That's not what they're asking. As used in line fifty four, it's more like lack. Yeah, for sure. To want for something. There's a there's a, a famous poem or I don't know, something like that. I think it was like Benjamin Franklin. Have you heard it? It's like For Want of a Nail. Have you heard that one? Uh, maybe. It's like For Want of a Nail, the horseshoe was lost. For Want of the Horseshoe, the horse was lost. For Want of a Horse, the battle was lost. For the loss of the battle, the war was lost or something like that. All For Want mm. of a Nail. Right. Gotcha. Want can also mean lack. Yeah. Yeah. Not a super common use of it, but here it's the only one that makes sense. I mean, plug in C and D. Let me hear C and D as well. So requirement in place okay. of of want. Of, uh, want. The requirement of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour of every day. How's that? That doesn't no, really. No, no. We're not talking about Miss Taylor's requirement. Yeah. What requirement? That doesn't make any sense. What about request D? Okay. The request of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour of every day. Still not Miss nah, Taylor. No, no. Yeah, we're still not talking about something belonging to Miss Taylor, right? We're not talking about her request or her requirement or her desire. Right. We're talking about Emma's desire. Therefore, it's the lack of Miss Taylor. Tricky. It's very tricky. But B is correct. Any questions? No. See why I got to plug them in? That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's not just synonyms here. It's as used in this line, in this context. Question number seven. Go ahead and read it, please. Okay. It can be most reasonably be inferred that after Miss Taylor married, she had... Okay. What does it mean to infer? To, like, assume. Yeah, kind of to assume. Okay. And we, we can make some assumptions based on the evidence. We can't. Okay. Okay. So it can reasonably be inferred that after Miss Taylor married, she had... Ooh, let's test the answer choices. Go and read A. Um, less patience with Mr. Woodhouse. Okay, can it be inferred that after Miss Taylor married, she had less patience with Mr. Woodhouse? Doesn't really specify who she is, but... It's, wait, oh, it would be Miss Taylor. But that wouldn't really make sense at all. No. Yeah. It, well, yeah. yeah. Does Miss Taylor have less patience with Mr. Woodhouse? No. I don't know. I don't see any of it. I mean, I no yeah, it doesn't, there's it doesn't no reason to believe that. It doesn't talk about the relationship between Miss Taylor and Mr. Woodhouse at all. Yeah. Uh, no. I mean, other than when they were living in the home, they were all like family, but uh, no, no. There's just no evidence for that. Try B. 
uh, fewer interactions with Emma. Can it reasonably be inferred that Miss, when Miss Taylor married, she had fewer interactions with Emma? Yes. I think so. What are you basing that on? What lines are you basing that on? Um, I'm not sure exactly what lines it was, but I definitely... It's in the second half. Yeah. Um, See if you can find them. Okay. Um, probably around line 75. Yeah. Yeah. Read those lines. Um, but Emma was aware that great must be the difference between a Miss Weston only half a mile from them and a Miss Taylor in the house. Can you infer from that that they have fewer interactions? Yes. I think so. I think it's pretty reasonable. Let's keep B. Let's try C. It can be most reasonably be inferred that after Miss Taylor married, she had more close friends than Emma. Can that be inferred? No. No. It says nothing about her friends. I mean, yeah. she's married to do. I mean, maybe if it said had a closer friend than Emma, maybe, I don't know. I mean, her husband's a friend. Maybe he is. I don't know. I mean, it's just, again, there's just no more close friends. No. There's no. Doesn't evidence. really. No. Yeah. I mean, compare that to B. Right, which we've got some evidence for B. There's just nothing for C. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Try D. Um, and, and by the way, real quick, I love the fact that you reread the question. I okay. love it. I mean, that's really what you should do. I've been doing that for you. I've been kind of modeling that for you. But that's exactly how you should approach it. You never okay. lose sight of the question. All right. So try D. It can be most reasonably be inferred that after Miss Taylor married, she had an increased appreciation for Emma. Can that be inferred? Um, probably not. I don't see evidence for it. Yeah, like, it, I would assume, like, she would have had an appreciation for her, but it doesn't say that it, anywhere. It may be true. It may yeah. be true. I mean, with these fictional characters here, right? I mean, that's reasonable sounding enough. But is there evidence for it? We've got evidence for B. Yeah. I just don't see any evidence for D. with what you know. So, go with B. <laughs> right? And it's B. It's B. <clears throat> cool. Does that make sense? Yes. Again, you can't get lost in your brain and be like, hmm, if I, you know, moved away from a friend, I might appreciate her more. Okay, that's fine. Whatever. I don't care about you. <laughs> the SAT doesn't care about you. <laughs> okay? I'm not sure. I should say I don't care about you, Katie. But, 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 <laughs> but <laughs> I don't care what you think about how you would feel in that situation. That I truly do not care about. Right. That is true. <laughs> And the SAT certainly cares even less. What is there evidence for? There's evidence for B, not for D. Okay. Look at question number A. Oh, great. What's the answer? What's the D. answer? D. Yeah. D. For sure. <laughs> 73 to 79. Done. Done. Two for one. Yeah. Right there. Now, if you didn't know the answer to seven, what do you do? Go check the other lines. Check the other lines. Lines for A. Which is a very reasonable thing to do. It's the thing to do. Gotcha. And we'll see some questions where you're going to have to do that, where it's not as clear, maybe, for the first question in the two for one. But here, okay. we, could, we could figure it out. You're, you're more likely to be, if you can find the evidence on your own, it's more likely to be accurate. Because sometimes they, they make up, like, they're basing the, the answers to seven on some of the lines from eight. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And, um, and sometimes they seem to even match up the evidence for eight and, and the answers for seven. They kind of match up on a certain level. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you kind of, you can get around all that if you can find the evidence to seven on your own. Yeah, for but sure. But if you don't have kind any. kind of sneak in the right answer yeah. all the way down at D. So if you're going from top to bottom, by that point, you're yeah. probably, you're like, oh, this kind of fits. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. And that's how they're trying to trick you. So if you can, if you can avoid all that by just finding the evidence on your own, great. But if you can't, your best bet is to go to the lines. Okay. Question number nine is tricky. And this is a little bit different from the others. This one probably requires you to, to, to be the most creative. I, I really want to avoid thinking in terms of like you thinking too much on your own here. Cause we can still, we're still sure. basing the answer on evidence from the text, but this one you gotta, you gotta think. A little bit more than, than most. Go ahead and read question number nine for me, please. All right. 
which situation is most similar to the one described in lines 83 to 91? Okay, well, the evil blank time. Yeah, so I mean, what do we have to do before we answer this one, Kate? Um, read the answer choices. No. Oh. Oh, go to the the lines. Yeah, we better go to the lines, right? 83. Yeah, what is so know what, what is the situation described in 83 through 91? I may you may not remember. Exactly. Yeah. Right? So you better you got to have it fresh in your mind. So, you're going to and you're going to have time to do it. You will. With practice. Okay. With practice, you will. So let's go back and especially this is untimed works. So let's just do it the right way. Read 83 through 91 for me, please. All right. Um, he could not meet her in conversation. Uh, no, oh, no, 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 no. Um, the evil of the actual disparity in their ages, and Mr. Woodhouse had not married early, was much increased by his constitution and habits, for having been a valetudinarian all his life without activity of mind or body. He was a much older man in ways than years, and though everywhere he looked for the friendliness of his heart and his amiable timber, his talents could not have recommended him at any time. Okay. So, we've got to find the situation most similar to the one described in those lines. And we still have to base this on evidence in the text. Okay. Okay. Go ahead and read A. A mother and her adult son have distinct tastes in art and music that result in repeated family arguments. Is that similar to the situation described in lines 80 through 91? Similar, but not near enough. Yeah, it's not... It just what's... doesn't... It... It's similar, but very different. What's off? That. What's off? I don't like A. What's off? They're not having a? arguments. They're not having any arguments. Yeah. At all. So I don't like that. Do Emma and her yeah. father have distinct tastes? In our, our, well, I mean, maybe. This is the second Probably, half. But it doesn't say anything in concrete yeah, terms. Yeah, yeah. But that argument thing really bothers me. Yeah. I don't like that. Try B. The differences between an older and a younger friend are magnified because the younger one is more active and athletic. Is that similar to the situation described in lines 8 through 91? Yes. It's similar. Why is it similar? I agree. Because it's an older person and a younger person, and yeah. one is not doing as well as the other is. Yeah, yeah. That's similar. I mean, it's not exact, right? I'm obviously, it's not saying what, you know, perfectly parallels or something like that. Yeah. But it's similar. Let's keep B. Right? Do we see the difference why we can eliminate A based on the evidence in the text? Yes. And we can't for B. In fact, we can find some evidence to support it. So let's keep B. Try C. Okay. An older and a younger scientist remain close friends despite the fact that the older one's work is published more frequently. Is that similar to the situation described in lines 83 through 91? Um, no, it, they're not very... It, it doesn't say that they're very close and then... It doesn't say anything about the older one gets more things. Just, yeah. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, it just doesn't. Especially, yeah, especially the older one. Yeah, they're not that close, I guess, I guess even, right? I mean, they like each yeah. other, I guess, but but they're not super close. They're not. And then the older one's, like, more successful in Ants Choice C. Yeah, that right? just doesn't. And that's just kind of the opposite of the situation with Emma and her father, right? Emma's the one with more right. talent and and just sort of social advantages, and, and the father not so much. It's kind of the opposite. Does that make sense? Yes. And we're still basing that on evidence in the text. Still. As much as you kind of have to, you have to engage your imagination a bit to imagine these situations. We're still eliminating yeah. the correct answer choices based on evidence in the text. Still. Go to answer choice D. All right. The age difference between a high school student and a college student becomes a problem even though they enjoy the same diversions. Is that similar to the situation described in 83 through 91? Um... No. No, why not? Because they they really don't enjoy this. <laughs> they don't. They just don't. Yeah, it, it even says that he doesn't. I don't know where it said it, but he, somewhere in there it didn't say that he likes to. He just kind of doesn't have conversations with her. Yeah, they, I think earlier in like lines 81 and 82, right? You could not meet her in conversation, rational yeah. and playful, right? And even though that's not lines 83 through 91, that's still evidence and context against answer choice D. Yeah. So, I don't like that. B is the best. Yeah. And it's the right answer. Cool. Any questions, Katie? Um, I don't believe so. Okay. Does the approach to the text that we're, we're using here, 
and the approach to the questions in this part of the class. Does that make sense? Yes. It's all about evidence in the text. Yeah. Don't think about how, what, what it makes you think about or how it makes you feel if you were the character or how you'd feel or any of that stuff. Don't get involved in that. It's all about what is the yeah. author saying? What is there evidence for? Is there evidence to support this answer choice or is there evidence to eliminate it? And if you can find evidence to support a particular answer choice and you can find evidence against three of the incorrect answer choices, you can feel very, very confident in the answer choice you've chosen. Gotcha. Okay. That's the name of the game. The more I do this test, you know, if, if, when I first started tutoring and like, I used to argue with these questions all the time. I used to get angry <laughs> at some of the questions. I was like, no, I can't be rid of this. You know, and, but again, I was sort of like swimming in the world of impressions. Like a lot of right. students do. But the more that I understand this test and the more I teach it, the more I'm like, it's black and white. Yeah, for it's sure. It's black and white. There's no opinion necessary here. None at all. Either this is supported with evidence or it's not. Or there's evidence against it. Period. You don't have to bring in your your outside opinion. Own opinions. Yeah. Ever. Your feelings. <laughs> just, it's just look at what it says. It's black and white. Connect the dots. Yep, that's it. It's black and white. 